Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel Medicine Decoded. Now in this video I am going to discuss with you a very common yet very basic symptom and that is dysmenorrhea which means painful periods. Now we all know that all women to some extent or the other experience spasmodic, periodic, cyclical lower abdominal pain during her periods and that is what we call as dysmenorrhea. Now when we talk about dysmenorrhea it is important to categorize them into two types. One is primary dysmenorrhea and the other is secondary dysmenorrhea. Right? So all women, you know, they go through, like I told you, some uh, degree of lower abdominal pain during her periods and there is no pelvic pathology as such. This is something which is physiological, right? Obviously, uh, each woman will have her own pattern of uh, pain, uh, her own perception to pain. Uh, each woman's body will respond differently to that uh, same uh, pain. So yes, of course, uh, but the most important point to note here is that there is no pelvic pathology and we don't describe it as a spasmodic sort of a pain. Whereas with secondary dysmenorrhea, there is a pelvic pathology and women describe it as congestive form of a pain. So it's also called as congestive dysmenorrhea and in the backdrop you can see the image that yes of course there is some of the other pelvic pathology which may be contributing to this. Now if you compare the onset of primary versus secondary dysmenorrhea. Now see here when uh, the puberty starts and when the menses start the initial uh, cycles for the first one to two years are anovulatory and anovulatory cycles at that point in time they are characteristically painless. However as and when you know ovulation sets in because of uh, the maturity of the hypothalamic pituitary axis that takes some time after the onset of menses. So once ovulation sets in the periods start becoming painful. Right? So the onset of primary dysmenorrhea is about 1 to 3 years uh, you know, after the onset of menarche and it is typically more often problematic and seen in younger women because as and when we age you see what happens is we get accustomed to whatever sort of menstrual bleeding pattern or uh, you know, whatever sort of uh, abdominal pain or cramps that we may have. Now secondary dysmenorrhea on the other hand as far as the onset is concerned is going to happen years after menarche once you know some pathology sets in. So there will be a young woman maybe who's had you know previously normal menstrual cycles with usual amount of pain which was fine for her but now all of a sudden her pain has intensified right so years after menarche another important point to note here is that this secondary dysmenorrhea occurs because of some pelvic pathology so that is why it can even occur in anovulatory cycles as well now keep that in mind. Now moving on, let us have a look at the physiology of menstrual pain, physiology of the spasmodic dysmenorrhea. So we know what happens in the menstrual cycle, right? Each month an egg is released and ovulation happens. So in the first half of the cycle, the follicle is growing. The growing follicles, they are secreting estrogen. That is causing buildup of the endometrial lining. And once the egg is released after that, what remains behind is the corpus luteum and then this corpus luteum secretes progesterone to bring about the secretory changes over the endometrium in the second half of the cycle and ultimately this corpus luteum dies and when the corpus luteum regresses there is progesterone withdrawal right progesterone levels decline and that results in local release of prostaglandins. So prostaglandins are released here at the level of the endometrial tissue. Now these locally released prostaglandins can work in a variety of ways. I mean prostaglandins are by nature pain inducing substances in our body 
as well right so these prostaglandins they increase the uterine myometrium contractions so crampy pain they are also responsible for causing uterine muscle ischemia that also contributes to pain they are also responsible for sensitizing the nerve endings and therefore pain so by a variety of mechanisms there can be pain in physiologically ovulatory cycles right now having said that women who have excess of prostaglandins that are released right if there is imbalance of prostaglandins right now prostaglandin synthesis requires the action of the enzyme cyclooxygenase so it has been suggested the enzyme that is responsible for prostaglandin synthesis is upregulated so upregulated cyclooxygenase enzyme activity these could be the reasons why some women have more pain than others these are the reasons why for example if there is any pelvic pathology which can result in you know imbalance of prostaglandins that can also be a responsible cause for you know excess painful periods so this is the pathophysiology here or let's say for example so this is the physiology here which helps us understand the primary spasmodic dysmenorrhea on the other hand if you look at secondary dysmenorrhea there are variety of causes which are responsible pelvic pathology that are responsible now what are those most commonly it is endometriosis endometriosis is a situation where endometrial glands and stroma are located outside the uterus so they can be located anywhere in the pelvis they can be located over the ovaries they can be located anywhere along the pelvic peritoneum so mostly over the ovaries the pouch of douglas the uterosacral these are the common sites right so endometriosis is the most common cause of secondary dysmenorrhea followed by adenomyosis now adenomyosis is a condition where there is endometrial glands and stroma deep within the myometrium and that can be responsible for severe congestive dysmenorrhea secondary dysmenorrhea along with abnormal uterine bleeding as well okay now the other cause of secondary dysmenorrhea which is often overlooked is any non hormonal intrauterine device right like for example copper tea right this is a non hormonal intrauterine device which could also explain secondary dysmenorrhea in women then there could be pelvic inflammatory disease right so pelvic inflammatory disease could involve the fallopian tubes most commonly that is where it is involved and it could involve the um, ovaries also there could be a tubo ovarian pathology combined and pelvic inflammatory disease will also be more responsible for causing pelvic congestion will also be responsible for causing more release of you know local prostaglandin release and sensitize the nerve terminals towards pain so pid is one important cause there could be ovarian cysts as a cause of secondary dysmenorrhea less likely but that could be the reason pelvic adhesions because of any reasons they have formed maybe because of chronic pid adhesions may have formed because of genito urinary tuberculosis pelvic adhesions may have formed because of endometriosis but pelvic adhesions could also be responsible for causing secondary dysmenorrhea other causes could be any factor which leads to pelvic congestion that could also explain secondary dysmenorrhea 
other than that less commonly encountered but yes to complete the list we can have uterine or vaginal anomalies right now which sort of uterine or vaginal anomalies let me give you an example for example if there is um, a unicornuate uterus with a rudimentary horn a functional rudimentary horn and inside that rudimentary horn uh, bleeding happens each month now that is a rudimentary horn it gets distended and stretched it gets filled with blood so wherever there is a component of outflow obstruction not complete but partial wherever there is a component of outflow obstruction there can be congestive dysmenorrhea secondary dysmenorrhea because of that and finally to complete the list polyps can also cause secondary dysmenorrhea right now what kind of polyps now particularly yes if there are polyps now there could be large endometrial polyps there could be a fibroid polyp right so usually polyps and fibroid polyps for that matter they are mostly asymptomatic and they also you know lead to irregular or heavy menstrual bleeding as well but they can also lead to secondary dysmenorrhea because you know during periods when the uterus uh, has you know some degree of contractions it it is like it, the uterus is trying to expel uh, these uh, contents here the polyps here outside so in that there can be a more painful periods as well so that could explain the secondary dysmenorrhea with particular kind of polyps right so these could be broadly the differential diagnosis of secondary dysmenorrhea now moving on what is the clinical presentation of primary dysmenorrhea like i told you that these are mostly going to be younger women right and they typically say that the pain starts at the start of menses right so the pain begins on the day that bleeding starts that as and when the flow increases right the pain tends to become less severe so she particularly has pain more so during the first few days of the cycle first few days of bleeding not through throughout the bleeding okay so that is one important concept here it lasts for for most women about 48 to 72 hours she could also have some suprapubic cramping along with it she could also have uh, you know back ache along with it she could have nausea and vomiting along with it some women complain of dizziness along with it maybe vomiting and nausea some women also complain of diarrhea along with this at the same time some people complain of some some sort of lightheadedness as well and some women may complain of headache also right so there can be associated symptoms but history is more or less enough to make the diagnosis of primary dysmenorrhea and there should be no clinical evidence at least of a pelvic pathology right so the pelvic examination findings are absolutely normal and there is no suspicion of a pelvic pathology if there is a suspicion of pelvic pathology for that matter okay or let's say for example many women you know they often take over the counter analgesics or antispasmodics for their period pain and usually they take NSAIDs right so if a woman gives a history that you know she does often take NSAIDs during her periods but that is not giving her any relief her usual medication is not giving her any relief then maybe yes an ultrasound can be done to rule out a pelvic pathology so keep that in mind and moving on let's talk about the treatment of primary dysmenorrhea so something that all women have tried and find it very useful yes a significant amount of pain relief can be achieved by abdominal massage you know counter pressure local heat application and if such conservative measures are not helpful drug treatment can also be prescribed and something that is commonly prescribed is the use of NSAIDs are uh, typically those containing antispasmodic properties like mephenamic acid and they can be used during periods in the first few days when there is pain and the dose can be you know titrated four to six hourly a woman can be prescribed these NSAIDs as well so NSAIDs are going to work by decreasing the release and synthesis of prostaglandins so that is how they're going to work and other than that uh, hormonal 
contraceptives right particularly the combined hormonal contraceptives be it in the form of pills as well like the oral contraceptive pills now these hormonal contraceptives are also favored particularly by those women who also want contraceptive uh, benefit of these uh, contraceptives as well so for those set of women it is very fine right so hormonal contraceptives they work why because you see they inhibit ovulation okay uh, all in all together they are more progestational in action and they uh, decrease the endometrial proliferation and when a woman is on hormonal contraceptives you see the uh, endocrine status of her endometrium uh, is constantly maintained like that of the early proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle right now for example let's say um, when you have regular cycles and ovulation you see endometrium is exposed to first estrogen then progesterone then progesterone withdrawal so this fluctuation of hormone keeps taking place right but when a woman is on hormonal contraception there is no such hormonal fluctuation that is seen so constantly one is taking the pill or constantly she is exposed to hormonal contraception over the month it leads to the endocrine status of the endometrium resembling like that of the early proliferative the first part of the menstrual cycle when prostaglandin levels are at their minimum at their lowest so they offer relief from uh, dysmenorrhea right so like i told you particularly advantages for those set of women who want the contraceptive benefits as well now if the woman says that she is having pain that begins about one to two weeks prior to her actual flow of menses even before the bleeding starts she gets that signal she knows her periods are going to start because she started having pain a week or two prior to the actual blood flow and then the pain lasts throughout okay so for the days that bleeding happens throughout that time pain also occurs we call it severe congestive dysmenorrhea so history itself will tell us that we are dealing with secondary dysmenorrhea and then it is important to rule out pelvic pathology now we considered what are the differential diagnosis so you're going to take a targeted history towards that is there any history of vaginal discharge maybe there is some evidence of pelvic inflammatory disease is there any history of abnormal uterine bleeding also adenomyosis could present with heavy menstrual bleeding polyps could present with abnormal uterine bleeding pattern right um genito urinary tuberculosis for that matter could present with heavy bleeding uh, but mostly it leads to decreased or scanty periods keep that in mind also so any pattern of abnormality could be there right uh, history of dyspareunia very very important painful coitus history of let's say having um, been trying to conceive and not achieving conception a history of infertility whether primary whether secondary infertility you should keep that in mind because that is very very important to rule out uh, the possibility of endometriosis so history of dyspareunia history of infertility as well in the past right and non midline focal pelvic pain so supra pubic cramping is what happens in primary spasmodic dysmenorrhea whereas if the pain is towards one or the other side non midline focal pelvic pain then there is more likely possibility that there is a pelvic pathology so keep that in mind and then you perform a pelvic examination in the pelvic examination note the size of the uterus note the adnexal size there any adnexal tenderness is the uterus looking enlarged right is there any adnexal mass that you can palpate so note the size the shape as well as the mobility of the uterus because you see 
see when there are going to be pelvic adhesions it can make the mobility of the uterus restricted so restricted mobility will be there with pelvic adhesions look for adnexal tenderness on any mass right look for nodularity over the uterosacrals and pouch of douglas so this nodularity would go more in favor of the diagnosis of endometriosis with endometriosis there can also be a fixed you know retroverted uterus also at the same time so your pelvic examination findings plus your history will give you a clue to the underlying pelvic pathology and further investigations that you're going to order will depend upon the history and examination findings so if on examination you're suspicious right if your examination yields any positive findings you definitely would like to go for an ultrasound pelvis at least right and other than that investigations will depend upon the history and examination findings like for example if you're suspecting that there may be a pelvic inflammatory disease there is a history of vaginal discharge on examination there is cervical discharge there is cervical uh, uh, inflammation that you can see and there is evidence of uh, infection there then you can you know send for the endocervical swab you can send the discharge for uh, you know nucleic acid amplification tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea now that will depend on the findings right there may be cases of sub acute pid which present with uh, you know congestive dysmenorrhea or secondary dysmenorrhea so you can at least go for a complete blood count and ESR in those circumstances so basically you know offer investigations depending upon your history and clinical examination findings ultrasound is often used yes to rule out any pelvic pathology right now moving on now moving on one last thing that i would like to tell you is many times you know we start women for the treatment of dysmenorrhea on uh, nsaids and then um, they try it for a couple of months three to six months and they're not relieved rather the pain has in fact increased then keep in mind the underlying possibility of endometriosis as your top priority diagnosis and uh, cater your investigations to the history and the physical examination findings having said that if you look at the treatment approaches for secondary dysmenorrhea you may cater your treatment to the underlying pathology to the underlying cause that you are suspecting or that you have diagnosed now that in itself uh, it becomes a huge topic to discuss because each of these gynae conditions are dealt with differently so this is me for now talking about dysmenorrhea i hope you found this uh, i hope you found this video useful